We need to ensure that Brexit is Britain's Sputnik moment. Now let me explain. In October 1957, a small silver ball, about yay big, with four long prongs sticking out of it, went into low orbit around the Earth. That was Sputnik 1, the first artificial satellite, and it whizzed about in low orbit at about 29,000 kilometers per hour, lapping the Earth every 96 minutes. And as it was doing that, it sent out a tone, a radio tone, like that, for about 21 days until its battery ran up. But this radio signal was picked up by even amateur radio enthusiasts um, all over the world, and it freaked America out. Now, America was already slightly freaked out because in 1949, the Russians had detonated um, an atomic bomb just four years after they had. But the launch of Sputnik 1 impressed upon America that another country was actually ahead of them in terms of science. And they felt that strongly threatened their security. So what they did is instantly overnight, um, it was a massive public issue and there was a political will to ramp up science where there hadn't been before, it hadn't got through Congress before. And so the National Science Foundation um, jumped in investment from a pittance to being extremely well funded. Um, and it wasn't just the space race, it wasn't just the hard sciences, the National Institutes of Health, um, their funding um, if you look at it as a proportion of GDP, went up about tenfold from the late 50s to the early 60s. And even in the 1960 presidential campaign, science was a major issue. So America invested in science heavily to get ahead and stay ahead, maintain its leading role, and it succeeded in doing that, and it brought with it an economic boom. Now, did you know that according to the National Academies of the US, that over 50% of the economic growth from the end of World War II to the present day can be attributed to science and technology. So investing in science is a major boon for a country. Now let's come back to the UK in our Sputnik moment, and there's a phrase which is, never let a good crisis go to waste. Now, not that Brexit is a good crisis, but what can we do with it? Clearly, it is something of a Sputnik moment for us on a lesser level because we are currently in the lead globally, recent over, recently overtook the US for productivity of our science base, the, the bang for the buck, the money you put in, what you get out of it. And we're widely regarded as a leading force and in fact we more so for being in the driving seat of the EU which is a much larger science program than the US in terms of output and in terms of research base but now we're being pulled away from that and so that does jeopardize our position I mean we're six weeks after the Brexit vote and we already have tons of documentation about people leaving uh, researchers not wanting to come to the UK because of Brexit, students not wanting to come to the UK because of Brexit, um, and also problems on Horizon 2020, particularly the coordinator roles. Like when I was in the House of Lords Science and Technology Committee in front of them, I said specifically it's the coordinator roles that are in threat because that's where Switzerland had their problem. Um, so we're looking at a lot of fallout because we don't know the relationship with the EU science program and our own funding is at the bottom of the G8 in terms of money invested in science and innovation per GDP. So we do have something of a crisis on. So now is actually a moment to alert the public and our politicians to this, to this critical state we are in and rethink British science's position in the world and absolutely petition for more funding. And the threat is that as Brexit crisis unfolds, there will be lots of other domains of society petitioning for money and for support. And our politicians, 85% of them or more, don't have a STEM background. They don't understand science and they also don't regard science as a political issue and a public issue on which they feel pressured. 
So I strongly think that just petitioning our politicians is not the right way to go about this. We've been sidelined many times before and we will be again if that is our only approach. What we have to do is get all of these stories out, what is actually happening to the wider public. And through that pressure, we can affect the change that we actually need in order to preserve science and all of its beneficial effects to our society. So how do we do that? We need our science journalists badly. They are the ones that communicate what is happening within our community to the wider public. We also need petitions, as have been set up recently, not just from um, the, the great and the good and the National Academies of Science, but from all of our community. So our campaign is one, but then there was also a, is still a petition that has 35,000 signatures to the, the government about maintaining our relationship with the EU science program. There was another letter about early career uh, researchers that had 1,600 signatures of early career researchers that went in. And um, the Royal Society had launched a Twitter campaign called Science is Global. This is all good stuff. We need to keep the pressure on. And what we need to do in our community is to be feeding all of our personal stories and experiences and what's going on to the science journalists and writing ourselves through whatever media we can get hold of in order to make that case. Science needs to be political. A lot of people think that science shouldn't be political. It should be aloof from that or away from that. Science has been historically very political. It's only in recent years that we've had this kind of cloistered divorce from political discussion. But it's absolutely vital that we get involved in politics, not partisan, political. It's vital that we get involved in it because science and technology provide so many of the solutions to the problems we are facing. So I'd like to finish on, on um, a quote um, by Thomas Jefferson. Um, who was actually a very avid scientist. There weren't, there weren't uh, professional scientists in that day, really. But Thomas Jefferson always had a telescope in his pocket and was always taking readings about the weather, a climate scientist even. But this is a very interesting quote from him, slightly redacted. Nature intended me for the tranquil pursuits of science, but the enormity of the times in which I have lived has forced me to commit myself to the boisterous ocean of political passions. And so must we, I think, respond to the times in which we live and actually openly communicate with the public about science, re-establish that bond and get involved in politics because that is our duty. And if we don't do it, then I think we're going to lose out on the very thing that we love and we want to nurture. Incidentally, this book, um, The War on Science by Sean Otto, an American writer, is a fantastic read and it documents how science in America is on the decline and under attack. And um, I recommend that you all read it and I'll be discussing more from it later.